The Untold History of Semanawak. This is Semanawak. As you can see, it covers a good chunk of our planet. Semanawak comes from the Nahuatl language of Sem entirely and Anahuac, land surrounded by water. Semanawak is how we should know our whole continent instead of America or the Americas. Anahuac, land surrounded by water, is situated in the northern part of Semanawak so-called North America, and it covers what today is known as Mexico, Central America, and the rest of the so-called U.S. and Canada, which are people in that area knew as Turtle Island. Tahuantinsuyo is in the southern part of our continent. Tahuantinsuyo comes from the Quechua language and it means the land of the four quarters. We begin with the civilization of the Omics. This civilization has been known as the mother and father civilization. It is the oldest civilization in Anahuac dating to 2300 BC. The name Omic derives from the Nahuatl language which translates to the people of the rubber. This name was not given by the Omic themselves. The Omics most likely spoke a language of the Mishe Sokian family. It was the Omics that were the originators of architecture, astronomy, agriculture, writing, theology, and all other features that brought about the civilization of Anahuac. The Omic heartland was in the area of Veracruz and Tabasco in what today is known as Mexico. The Omics influence was widespread. It covered the Mayan lowlands and highlands in the Yucatan Peninsula. With a strong presence in Guatemala and the state of Guerrero among other areas. By about 1000 BC the Omic civilization had reached the area of the Gulf of Mexico up the Mississippi River and up the Ohio River. Here Poverty Point was reached in Louisiana 1000 BC, the Adena 500 BC, the Hopewell 200 BC, and Cahokia near St. Louis. Where the Omics traveled they brought not only the idea of civilization but also brought with them something that was responsible for the civilization, corn. Corn was the engine that sustained a growing population. Corn became the staple of an early Anahuac, much on how the ancient Sumerians depended on wheat, China with the rice, our people depended on corn. This will eventually few other Nicantalaca cultures all throughout Anahuac. And also became a staple in Tahuantinsuyo. The Omic heartland areas are known as San Lorenzo, Tres Zapotes, and La Venta. We know the Omics today mostly for their enormous basalt stone heads uncovered in different archaeological sites. So far there have been only 16 of these heads found. They were carved to honor rulers, priests, or perhaps ball players. It is also known that some of these stone heads were either carved at, at the site or they were carved once they reached their final destination many miles away. The effort and manpower to move these giant heads must have been something to behold. The Olmecs were master artists and sculptors as we can see with these amazing masks in the center made of light green jadeite. These masks were used by priests performing rituals or were made to honor the dead. Not only did our ancestors the Olmec create gigantic sculptures but sculpted smaller artifacts with intricate detail. These are some of the other less known artifacts created by our ancient ancestors. In a previous slide I mentioned that the Omic were known in the Nahuatl language as the people of the rubber. This is due to the fact that it was the Omic who were the first people to introduce rubber to the world. The sap or latex was extracted from the rubber tree. Let's find out the meaning of the word Olmec. As I said before, we really don't know what the Olmec called themselves. The name Olmec was given to the inhabitants of that region by some of our Nahuatl speaking people. The plant you see on the left is the Uli tree. And Mekat, rope. 
together Ulmekat, the people of the lineage of the rubber. Of course, using the word Mekat in the Nahuatl language also represented the umbilical cord. It was the Omics, the creators of the first rubber ball, that was used in ball courts throughout Anahuac. The archaeological zone of El Manati is where the oldest rubber ball was found in San Lorenzo, where the oldest known constructed ball court is found. The game is known today as Ulama, from the Nahuatl word Ulamalistli, or also Tachtli during the time of the Mexica. This game was taken to different and far places of Anahuac. Archaeologists and historians seem to think that this game served different purposes in our Anahuac world. It served as a way to settle differences between warring states or cities, but also served to reenact the birth of the cosmos. The ball courts and the ball game differentiated from area to area, time period to time period, and civilization to civilization. The ball game was played mostly using the hip a stick, and in some cases players also used hands. There was different types of ball courts, but the most common were the open-ended court and the I-shaped court. I-shaped because it looked like the capital I. It is not known with certainty the rules our ancestors established for this game, but the main idea was the same. Our people had developed a game that honored creation and the beginning of time. On the upper left part of the slide, we could see what an eye ball court looked like. The idea was to have two opposing teams who in this case tried to outscore one another by shooting a rubber ball through a hoop located on both sides of the wall called an apron. On the right side we could see the different type of rings where the ball went through. The image on the bottom right demonstrates the game played with the hands. The image on the left is a painting that gives us an idea of what it must have looked like when our people participated in this amazing game. The ball was struck mainly with a hip and buttocks, or knee. This is perhaps one of the most important slides, because it highlights the different accomplishments that led to the development of our civilization. We begin with the image of the man, woman in the center, holding a child. This amazing figure is known as El Señor de las Limas. This figure was intentionally created this way to represent both man and woman, to illustrate the duality found around us. This aspect of male and female is what stimulates life. It symbolizes our universe in duality, our creator, and in turn it's holding the creation, a childlike that represents the four elements. The idea of duality is also seen right behind this figure, which is symbol of Ometeo, the creator and duality, which is in black and white. Black represents earth or material, and white represents the opposite, the non-material, the uncontained. Our ancient ancestors viewed our surroundings in a scientific way. We did not believe in God or gods, but we acknowledge our creator, which was found in every aspect, in every breath, in every form. It was our creator of the closeness and the far. We must first understand and imagine what could have stimulated the first strands of civilization. As Olintes Catripoca, founder of the Mexica movement, has explained, it could have started with our people first looking for food, which at this point our people were food collectors and lived a nomadic life, picking berries, acorns, and other plants, until someone had the idea of instead of going out and ev every day and gathering food far away, why not bring the plant or seed and plant it closer to home or a village. This way our people managed to have more control of certain plant or vegetable. We could see this most noticeably with the corn, and in order to know when to plant and when to harvest, we observed the cycles of the moon, and calculated the best time to plant and to harvest. This process we had to record. All this together brought about an organized way of tracking time, so this could have been handed down to future generations, which now had time to elect the leaders and designate who was going to do what. In the midst of all this, our people became more sedentary 
and develop better living conditions to keep away from the harsh elements. This drawing was created by the Mexican artist, historian, and archaeologist Miguel Covarrubias. He traveled to different parts of Mexico and Europe and gathered information on different art pieces or artifacts that had characteristics of being of Olmec influence. The idea of this illustration was to show on how the influence and how certain art or representations of the aspect of water derived from one source, being represented by the Olmec mask. Let's understand what a mask represented to our Olmec ancestors. As I explained before, our ancestors were trying to understand our Creator in every form and realized that they had to find a way to make it easy to read into this beautiful creation in a scientific way. One way was to use different features of majestic and incredible animals such as the eagle, snake, jaguar, and others. As we all know, these animals are skilled hunters and in many ways are on the top of the food chain. The eagle was seen as a representation of the sky, which in turn was associated with the sun. So our ancestors put the crest on top of the eyes. This picture gives us an idea of the different crests. The jaguar was a representation of earth and a skill hunter. So our people used it as the lips and mouth. As we can see here. The snake tongue was also used, as we can see, as well, in here. People often wonder what happened to certain people or civilizations. Why did they disappear? Where did they go? And so on. In the case of the Olmec and other of our civilizations, the Olmec did not disappear from the face of the earth. They moved on to different areas and eventually merged into other cultures, and so on. Same as to how people wonder what happened to the Maya or Aztec, correctly known as Mexica, or Inca. Well, if you are a Nican Tlaca, a person of indigenous descent, and you descend from the Mayan area, then you are probably Mayan. If you descend from Mexico City and you look mixed blood or full blood Nican Tlaca, then you probably are Mexica. Or if you are from the area of Peru or Ecuador, you are probably Quechua or Aymara. This is the breakdown of our Anahuac civilizations. These are the major civilizations that took place. We should keep in mind that most of these civilizations were never contemporary to one another. Archaeologists have placed these civilizations in time periods to have a better understanding. These time periods are known as pre-classic, classic, late classic, and post-classic. But in between some of these major civilizations, there were other less known civilizations and were contemporary to each other. In this breakdown, we could see the major contributions each one developed or is most known for. This is how civilizations looked in comparison with other civilizations, cultures, and other important events in world history. Keep in mind that these are not all of our Nicantalaca civilizations and cultures. As we can see, Samaria is the oldest and the first civilization created in the history of humanity. In the last 10 to 20 years, new findings have shown that Supecaral, an ancient Nicantlaca civilization found in the area of what today is known as Peru and Tahuantinsuyo, has been pushed by archaeologists to be the second oldest civilization in humanity, surpassing ancient Egypt several hundred years. The fourth oldest civilization would be ancient China, followed by the Indus Valley in the area of another Nicantlaca civilization, that of the Omic. These are the trade routes that connected Anahuac. This means that in ancient times our people traded goods such as precious stones like obsidian, jade, turquoise, pyrite, shells, and copper bells. Feathers were also in high demand. Some birds such as macaws were traded. These birds will come all the way from the Mayan lowlands and will make their way to the arid desert areas. Today we find roads, highways, or freeways that at one time served as trade routes for our ancestors. We seem to think that these roads were solely created by white people, but in fact, 
before they became the roads we know today, our ancestors have traveled and used them thousands of years before any European set eyes on them. We don't know how many trade routes our people developed, but we do know they went far. And more evidence has surfaced that our people in Anahuac traded with our people in the area of Tahuantinsuyo. We must understand that as a Nicantlaca people, we have inhabited this continent for over 50,000 years. This is one of the furthest states archaeologists and historians have pushed our presence on this continent. As a civilized people, we are being pushed to over 6,000 years with our civilization called Supecaral in Tahuantinsuyo. This should tell us that it is no wonder that in the northern areas of the so-called U.S., we also find temple structures that resemble those found in what today we know as Mexico, except these teocalis are made of earth, but work the same as the ones further south. This is Teotihuacan, located in present-day Mexico. Teotihuacan was one of the biggest cities in the world at this time. Teotihuacan was a metropolis at its height where Mayan, Zapotec, and other Nicantlaca people lived. In the top middle picture, we can see one of the massive Teocali known as the Pyramid of the Sun. Right underneath, we can see part of the Teocali known as the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. With elaborate stonework depicting feather serpents and fire serpents, the influence of the Teotihuacan was widespread. It went south to what we know as Guatemala and traded with the Mayan cities such as Tikal, Cobán, and even a small city called Caminaljuyo, which was an exact replica of Teotihuacan. Its influence went far north to present-day New Mexico and northern Arizona, where they traded with our Nicantalaca people in Pueblo Bonito, which was abandoned somewhere in the year 1200 AD. These are just some of the amazing pieces that Teotihuacan was known for, but other lesser-known pieces were also created by our Teotihuacan ancestors. We have learned that our ancestors thousands of years ago throughout Semanawak shared the idea of planting and harvesting foods that sustain our growing populations. But along with these foods also went ideas, trade, and our theology. Just to give an example, this piece of stonework was found in Guerrero in present-day Mexico. It belonged to the Hohokam culture in northern Arizona. This bowl from the Sunni area in present-day New Mexico suggests that there was some Teotihuacan influence with the design of what appears to be butterfly shape. Same for this mystic image. The idea of Quetzalcoatl was also picked up by some of our people in the area of Alabama. This bow-like was found in Tezahuapan, Guerrero, and its unusual form suggests contact with the area of Tahuantinsuyo. These three images demonstrate the vast influence and connection between our people from different areas. This is Tezcatlipoca from the area of the Mexica. This is Cocopelli, Hopi from the area of New Mexico. And Huracan from the Mayan language which translates to hurricane from the area of southern Mexico and so-called Central America. All these images, although different, represent the same idea, the manifestation of Earth, and on Earth there occurs the phenomenon of hurricanes represented with one foot. Here, here, and here.
These are the incredible cities of our people called the Maya. This style of architecture is called Puk. On the left top part of the slide is the city of Lavna in Yucatan. Right below is the city of Xpujil in Campeche. And on the right side, just some examples of the wonderful stonework representing the Kukulkan or Quetzalcoatl in the Mayan language and the manifestation of the water called Chac. On the right side, we can see Estela, which are carved stone monuments that honor certain important rulers or kings. These stelae also describe the life and indicated important dates of kings or leaders. This is the city of Tikal, one of the Mayan cities of our people in Guatemala. This city was built at the beginning of the Classic period. The Classic period is where our ancestors were most active in city building, creating art, writing, and so on. This is a giant stela in Quirigua, Guatemala. As you can see, its size in comparison with the young man standing right next to it. This is the Madrid Codex. These codices were books written by our ancestors both in the Mayan area, Mexica area, and other areas of our continent. Only a handful of these Nicantalaca books survived. Vast amounts of these books and libraries were burned down by the Spaniards. This is a lintel. In honor of the Mayan queen, her name was Oc Ain, and it dates to the 8th century AD. This is another example of the advanced Maya writing. This is the Mayan calendar. By combining the number 13, the smaller wheel in the center, with the 20 name days, the other larger wheel, and the other not fully shown was a 52 year count. Together, these calendars operated as an accurate instrument in calculating time. This is the last of our over 6,000 year old Semanawak civilizations. At its prime, the city was home to over 350,000 people. The city was built on a lake. It became one of the biggest cities in the world. From the word Mexica, we get the word Mexico, or Mexico, Mexican, and Mexicano, which in turn becomes Chicano. Our people, the Mexica, not only created one of the largest cities sitting atop of a man-made lake, but the city also housed botanical gardens, zoos, universities, hospitals, and the great thinkers of Semanawak. From what was gathered and the information that could be saved, our people were philosophers, astronomers, artists, and people who loved knowledge. There are only but a few books called Amoshtlis that survived. Here's an example. It was the Mexica who created this magnificent stone wrongly called the Sunstone, Aztec Calendar, or other names. For now we can call it Tonalpohuali, which is now what translates to the count of the days, until we accurately find the proper name for it. In previous slides we dealt with the topic of corn. But this topic has to be explained a bit more. Over 9,000 years ago, our ancestors began to domesticate something that we know to be an ancient ancestor of today's corn, the Oncite. We can see how small this ancestor of today's corn must have been. Our ancestors, through thousands of years, developed a wild grass until it reached the full size that we know today. Our people understood that through the process of agricultural engineering, we could convert a simple grass into a staple that fueled the development of our civilizations. It was corn in essence responsible for the creation of our great cultures and civilizations. We understood that we cannot separate ourselves from corn, and we also knew that without our intervention, corn cannot survive. From the earliest works of art beginning with the Omegs and all the way to the Mexica and down to the area of Tawantinsuyo, our people honored corn. We enriched our culture by creating art, songs, poetry, architecture, and myths in honor of this amazing staple. In fact, it is known today that the world depends on this staple that had its origins in Semanawak. 75% of the world's foods actually had its origins in Semanawak. Here are just some examples of those foods. Chocolate 
which in the Nahuatl language translates to bitter water, from choco, bitter, and at, water, These other foods also came out of Semanawak. Vanilla, tomatoes, squash, peanuts, chili, avocados, potatoes, pineapple, amaranth, beans. This is the flag of the people of Anahuac. We begin with the image at the center, which represents the Mayan Unafku or Ometeo, the self-created creator, which is at the heart of everything. It is a sacred duality. This symbol represents sky and earth, material and the non-material, life and death, male and female, order and disorder. Surrounding this image of duality and beginning with the color red, which is also the eastern direction where the sun rises, this color also represents Tlaloc and the element of water. The animal symbol was the owl. The second color is black which is the northern direction. This color represents the Scatlipoca and the element associated with earth. The animal is a jaguar. The third color is white, which is the west direction. This color represents Quetzalcoatl and the element is wind and the animal is a serpent. The fourth color is blue and represents the southern direction. This color belongs to Huitzilopochtli. The element is fire and the animal symbol is eagle. This is a flag that represents our world view, our universe, and how we view our creator. Our ancestors understood that we as humans were part of that universe. And we also constituted my new part of that universe. The four elements described here are also part of every living thing found in our world. As Olinte Scatlipoca has described, that all these elements are found within us. When we die, we become earth. A great percentage of our physical body is liquid. We inhale air and we also exhale it. And if we take our hand over our mouth, we can also feel our breath coming out a bit warm. That's because we have fire in our bodies. Fire in the form of our hearts to pump blood into our system to keep us alive. In the previous slides, we learned how our ancestors in a scientific way view our creator. But we must understand and put to rest the false notion that our people had many gods. Our people understood that there was only one creator and duality. What our people did do was to put many faces to try to describe this one creator. To understand this better, Olintes Caltripoca used the example of pictures. Imagine if someone were to take a picture of you as an infant in your mother or father's arms. Then a picture of you crawling, sitting, eating, talking, walking, reading, thinking, and so on. Which child in the pictures is you? Well, of course, it's all of them. That's how our people explain our creator and duality. By showing different pictures, aspects, manifestations, or features that together made up this one creator, which was known as Ometeo, Unavku, Ipalnemoani, Mokoyatsin, and other names. We also acknowledge our creator through duality as Tonantzin, Mother Earth, Tonatiu, Father Sky, and many other names that give name to one particular aspect of our creator which was also part of the fabric of this one creator and duality, Ometeo. This is the story that must be told. This is what our people used to describe the creation of the earth, of the cosmos, of ourselves. A long time ago, in Coatepec, in the direction of Tula, before there was no sky, before there was no earth and no sun, there existed a woman whose name was Kotlikwe. She was the mother of 400 sons and daughters and whose sister was named Koyoshauki. As Kotlikwe was doing penance on top of a temple, she swept. It was her duty to sweep. This is how she did penance on Kwatepec, the serpent's mountain. 
as Quatlique was sweeping, there flew an eagle. and descended upon her a ball of plumage. Quatlique picked up the ball of fine feathers and placed them in her bosom, and continued sweeping. When she was done sweeping, she looked for the feathers she had placed in her bosom to contemplate them, but she could not find them. What she realized is that she was pregnant. When the 400 brothers saw that their mother was pregnant, many grew angry. They saw this as very offensive and dishonorable. Koyolshauki said to them, Brothers, she has dishonored us. We must kill our mother, this perverse woman who is pregnant now. When Kwatlikwe heard of this, she was frightened. She was distressed, but from the womb, her son Kwisilopochtli comforted her and telling her not to be afraid. Meanwhile, the Sensoiznawa, the 400 brothers, met and plotted to kill their mother. In this manner, they prepared for battle. They attired themselves for war. But there was one of the brothers by the name of Kwawitlikak. Everything that the brothers said, he betrayed. Kwawitlikak alerted and spoke to Itzilopochtli, who was still in the womb. From atop top of a mountain, he said to him, They are coming! Huitzilopochtli, they are coming to kill you and your mother, Huitzilopochtli replied. Watch closely and see which way they come. Huahuitlikak said, They are coming now by the way of Sompantitlan. And Huitzilopochtli asked again, Now, which way are they coming? Huahuitlikak replied, Now, they are coming by the way of Coaxalpan. Huitzilopochtli once again asked Huahuitlikak. Huahuitlikak answered, they are coming along the mountain range. And yet once again, Wisilopochtli told him, Watch closely and see which way they come. Then Kwawitlika told him, They are on the peak. They are here. Koyoshauki is leading them. At that moment, Wisilopochtli was born in his warrior regalia. In his hand he held the shokoat, the fire serpent. Then, with a flaming serpent and a swift blow, he wounded Koyoshauki. He then turned and chased the brothers until he destroyed most of them. And finally, he also vanished Kwawitlikak. The story you just heard was the story our ancestors used to describe something that happens daily, the birth of the cosmos. This story we could see being played out right in front of our eyes, with Earth being Kwatlikwe. And we see Lopochli, who represents the sun. Being born out of earth or Kwatlikwe. The first thing that disappears when the sun comes out is Koyoshauki. who's also the moon. Then follows the stars. And finally, the last star to disappear is the evening star, Venus, Kwawitlikak. Who is also the morning star, the same star that came and warned with Silopochtli. In this picture, we see the story of the birth of the cosmos being played out in a remarkable way. The image on the left comes from Tikal in Guatemala. Here we see Kwawitlikak or Venus announcing the arrival of Huitzilopochtli or the sun. These temples were created by our ancestors as astronomical instruments, which are also used as myths and stories to describe the creation of the cosmos and celestial occurrences but were also representations of mountains which were sacred to our people. On the right side we see the birth of the cosmos as was described in the Mexica story in the previous slides. Here we see Kwawitlikak or Venus on top of that hill.
Our ancestors left us a tradition most of us don't know where it originated from. The tradition of the piñata, or more precisely the birth of the cosmos. It is this tradition that reminds us of what our ancestors wanted us to remember and acknowledge. The creation of everything, the Big Bang, the birth of the cosmos, the beginning of everything, of time. The so-called piñata, which is in the form of a star, with the shikoa, the fire serpent, represents time and space, and with the action of striking the Sitlali star, represents the birth of time.